why does the universe exist? Why is there a world? Okay, okay, all right. This is a cosmic mystery. Be solemn. Why is there a world? Why are we in it? Why is there something rather than nothing at all? I mean, this is the super ultimate why question. So I'm going to talk about the mystery of existence, the puzzle of existence,、uh, where we are now in addressing it, and why you should care. And I, I hope you do care.、Uh, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said that、uh, those who don't wonder about the contingency of their existence, of the contingency of the world's existence, are mentally deficient. All right, th- that's a little harsh, but but still.、Um, yeah. So this has been called the most sublime and awesome mystery, the deepest and most far-reaching question man can pose.、Uh, it's obsessed great thinkers. Ludwig Wittgenstein, perhaps the greatest philosopher of the、uh, 20th century, was astonished that there should be a world at all. He he wrote in his tractatus, Proposition 4.66, it is not how things are in the world that is the mystical; it's that the world exists. And if you don't like taking your epigrams from、uh, a philosopher,、uh, try a scientist. John Archibald Wheeler, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, the teacher of Richard Feynman, the coiner of the term、uh, black hole,、uh, he said, "I want to know how come the quantum, how come the universe, how come existence." And my friend Martin Ames. By the way, I'll be doing a lot of name dropping in this、uh, talk, so to get used to it. My 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 dear friend Martin Ames、uh, once said that、uh, <laughs> once said that we're about five Einsteins away from answering the mystery of where the universe came from. And I no doubt there are five Einsteins in the audience tonight.、Uh, any Einsteins? Show of hands. No, 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 no Einsteins. Okay, okay. So.、Um, Who, this question, why is there something rather than nothing? This sublime question was posed rather late in、uh, in intellectual history. It was in,、uh, towards the end of the 17th century.、Uh, the philosopher Leibniz, who asked it,、uh, very smart guy, Leibniz was a co-、uh, invented the calculus、uh, independently of Isaac Newton at about the same time. But for Leibniz, who asked, why is there something rather than nothing? This was not a great mystery. You know, he either was or pretended to be an orthodox Christian in his metaphysical outlook. And he said it's obvious why the the world exists because God created it, and God created it indeed out of nothing at all. That's how powerful God is. He doesn't need any pre-existing materials to fashion a world out of. He can make it out of sheer nothingness. Creation ex nihilo. And by the way, this is what most Americans today believe. There's no mystery of existence for them. God made it. Okay, so let's put this in an equation. Uh, I don't have any slides, so I'm going to mime my visuals. So use your imaginations. So it's、um, God plus nothing equals the world. Okay. Now that's the equation. And so maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you're a scientific atheist or, 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 or an unscientific atheist, and you don't believe in God, and you're not happy with it.、Uh, by the way, even if you even if you we have this equation, God plus nothing equals the world. There's already a problem. Why does God exist? You know,、uh, God doesn't exist by logic alone, unless you believe the ontological argument. I hope you don't, because it's not a good argument. So, you know, it, it, it's conceivable if, if God were to exist, He might wonder. You know, I'm eternal, I'm all powerful, but where did I come from?、Um, and and, and you know,、uh, whence then am I? God speaks in a more formal English, and um, so, um, and so, the, you know, one theory is that. God was so bored with pondering the puzzle of His own existence that He created the world, you know, just to distract Himself. But anyway, so let's first forget about God. So we have take God out of the equation. We have blank plus nothing equals the world. Now, if you're a Buddhist, you might want to stop right there, because essentially you've got what you've got is nothing equals the world, and by symmetry of identity, that means the world equals nothing. Okay, and to a Buddhist, the world is just a whole lot of nothing. It's a big、uh, cosmic vacuity. And、uh, you know we think there's a lot of something out there, but that's because we're enslaved by our desires. If we let our desires kind of melt away,、uh, we'll see the world for what it truly is—a vacuity, nothingness—and we'll slip into this happy state of nirvana, which has been defined as having just enough life to enjoy being dead. Okay, so that's it. That's the Buddhist thing. Okay, but but I'm not. I'm a I'm a Westerner, and I'm still con- concerned with the puzzle of existence. So I've got say blank plus. This is going to get serious in a minute. So, blank plus nothing equals the world. What are we going to put in that blank? Well, how about science? I mean, science is our best guide to the nature of reality, 
and the most fundamental science is physics. That tells us what naked reality really is. That that reveals what I call tau fotu, the true and ultimate furniture of the universe. So maybe physics can fill this blank. And indeed, since about you know 19, the late 1960s, around 1970, physicists have purported to give a purely scientific explanation of how a Universe like ours could have popped into existence out of sheer nothingness, a quantum fluctuation out of the void. Stephen Hawking is one of these physicists.、Uh, more recently,、uh, Alex Vilenkin, and the whole thing has been popularized、uh, by another very fine physicist and friend of mine, Lawrence Krauss, who wrote a book called、uh, "A Universe from Nothing." And Lawrence thinks that he's given a—he's a militant atheist, by the way. So he's gotten God out of the picture. The laws of quantum field theory, the state-of-the-art physics, can show how, out of sheer nothingness—no space, no time, no matter nothing—a little、uh, nugget of、uh, false vacuum can fluctuate into existence, and then, by the miracle of inflation, blow up into this huge and variegated cosmos we see around us. Okay, this is really—it's、um, an ingenious. Uh, scenario. It's very speculative. It's it's fascinating, but I've got a big problem with it, and the problem is this: it's a pseudo-religious point of view. Now Lawrence thinks he's an atheist, but he's still enthralled to a religious worldview. He sees physical laws as being like divine commands. You know, the the laws of quantum field theory for him are like fiat lux, let there be light. The they, the laws have some sort of ontological power or clout. That they can call, they can inform the abyss that it's it's pregnant with being. They can call a world into existence out of nothing, but that's a very primitive view of what a physical law is, right? We know that physical laws are actually、uh, generalized descriptions of patterns and regularities in the world. They don't exist outside the world. They don't have any ontic cloud of their own. They can't call a world into existence out of nothingness. That's a very primitive view of what of what a scientific law is. And if you don't believe me on this,、uh, you listen to Stephen Hawking, who himself put forward a model of the cosmos that was self-contained, didn't require any outside cause, any creator. And after proposing this, Hawking admitted that he was still puzzled. I mean, these you know these are just this model is just equations. What breathes fire into the, into the equations and creates a world for them to describe? He was puzzled by this. So. Equations themselves can't do the magic, can't resolve the puzzle of existence. And besides, even if the laws could do that, why this set of laws? Why quantum field theory that describes a universe with a certain number of forces and particles and so forth? Why not a completely different set of laws? There are, you know, many, many mathematically consistent sets of laws. Why not no laws at all? Why not sheer nothingness? So this is a problem, you know, believe it or not, that reflective physicists really think a lot about. And at this point, they tend to go metaphysical. Say, well, maybe the set of laws that describe our universe—it's just one set of laws, and it describes one part of reality. But maybe every consistent set of laws describes another part of reality. And in fact, all possible physical worlds really exist. They're all out there. We just see a little tiny part of reality that's described by the laws of quantum field theory. But there are many, many other worlds, parts of reality that are described by vastly different theories that are different from ours in ways we can't imagine. That are, you know, inconceivably exotic.、Um, Steven Weinberg, the father of the standard model of particle physics, has actually flirted with this idea himself that all possible realities. Actually exist.、Uh, also, a, a younger physicist, Max Tegmark, who believes that that all mathematical structures exist, and mathematical existence is the same thing as physical existence. So we have this vastly rich multiverse that encompasses every logical possibility. Now, in in, in taking this metaphysical way out. These physicists and also philosophers are actually reaching back to a very old idea that goes back to Plato. It's the the, the principle of plenitude or fecundity or you know the great chain of being. That that reality is actually as full as possible. It's as far removed from nothingness as it could possibly be. So, we have these two extremes now. We have sheer nothingness on one side, and we have this. Vision of a reality that encompasses every conceivable world at the other extreme—the fullest possible reality, nothingness, the simplest possible reality. Now, what's in between these two extremes? 
There are all kinds of intermediate realities that include some things and leave out others. So one of these intermediate realities is,、um, say, the most the most elegant, the most mathematically elegant reality that leaves out the inelegant bits, the the ugly asymmetries, and so forth. Now there's some physicists who will tell you that we're actually living in the most elegant reality. I I, I think that Brian Greene is in the audience, and he. Has written a book called *The Elegant Universe*. He claims that the universe we live in mathematically is very elegant. Don't believe him. It's 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 an ugly. No, it's a pious hope. I wish it were true. But, but I think the other day he admitted to me it's really an ugly universe.、Um, the the、uh, it's stupidly constructed. It's got way too many arbitrary coupling constants and, and and mass ratios and superfluous families of elementary particles and what the hell is dark energy? It's a it's a real、uh, it's a stick and bubble gum con- contraption. It's not an elegant universe.、Um, and then th- then there's the best of all. Possible worlds in an ethical sense. Now you should get solemn now because you know a, a world in which sentient beings don't suffer needlessly, in which there aren't things like、uh, like childhood cancer or the Holocaust. This is an ethical conception. And anyway, so between nothingness and the fullest possible reality, various special realities. Nothingness is special. It's the simplest. Then there's the most elegant possible reality. That's special. The fullest possible reality. That's special. But what are we leaving out here? There's also just the crummy, generic realities that、um, aren't special in any way. That are sort of random.、Uh, they're infinitely removed from nothingness, but they fall infinitely short of complete fullness. They're a mixture of chaos and order, of mathematical elegance and、uh, and ugliness. So there, I, you know, I would describe these realities as an incomplete, an infinite. Mediocre, incomplete mess, a generic reality, a kind of cosmic junk shot, and these realities. You know, is there a deity in any of these realities? Maybe, but the deity isn't perfect, like the Judeo-Christian deity. The deity isn't all good and all powerful. It might be instead、um, 100% malevolent, but only 80% effective, which would <laughs> pretty much describes the the world we see around us. I think so. So I would like to propose that the resolution to the, the mystery of existence is that that our the reality we exist in is one of these generic realities. Now reality has to turn out some way. It can either turn turn out to be nothing or everything or something in between. So if it has some special feature like being really elegant or really full or really simple like nothingness, that would require an explanation. But if it's just one of these random generic realities, there's no further explanation for it. And indeed, I would say that's the reality we live in. That's what science is telling us. That's what you know. The beginning of the week, we got the、uh, exciting information that the theory of inflation, which predicts a big, infinite, kind of messy, arbitrary, pointless reality, it's like a big, you know, frothing uh, uh, champagne coming out of, out of a bottle endlessly,、uh, a vast universe, mostly a wasteland with little pockets of charm and order and, and peace.、Um, You know, th- th- this is this has been confirmed this inflationary scenario by the observations made by radio telescopes in Antarctica that looked at the signature of the gravitational waves from the、uh, just before the Big Bang. I'm sure you all know about this. So anyway, I, I think there's a little、uh, there's some evidence that this really is the reality that we're stuck with. Now, why should you care? Well, w- well, well, the the question why. Does the world exist? That's the cosmic question. It sort of rhymes with a more intimate question: Why do I exist? Why do you exist? You know, our existence is really ama- it would seem to be amazingly improbable because there, you know, there's something like there's enormous number of genetically possible humans. If you can compute it by looking at the number of genes and the number of alleles and so forth, and it's a back of the envelope calculation will tell you there are about ten to the ten thousandth possible humans genetically. That's you know between a Google and a Googleplex. So.、Um, And the number of actual humans that have existed is an infinite, you know, 100 billion, maybe 50 billion, an infinitesimal fraction. So all of us, we've won this amazing cosmic lottery. We're here. Okay. So what kind of reality do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a special reality? What if we were living in the most elegant possible reality? What? Imagine the existential pressure on us to live up to that. You know, to be elegant, not to pull down the tone of it. 
Or what if we were living in the fullest possible reality? Well, then our existence would be guaranteed because every possible thing exists in that reality. But our choices would be meaningless. You know, if I if I really struggle morally and agonize, and I I decide to do the right thing, it does, what difference does it make? Because there are an infinite number of versions of me also doing the right thing and an infinite number doing the wrong thing. So my choices are meaningless. So we don't want to live in that special reality. And As for the special reality of nothingness, I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So, so okay. So I think living in a generic reality that's mediocre. You know, there there are nasty bits and nice bits, and we can make the nice bits bigger and the nasty bits smaller, and that gives us a kind of purpose in life. You know, the universe is absurd, but we can still construct a purpose, and that's a pretty good one. And the the overall medi- mediocrity of reality. Kind of resonates nicely with the mediocrity we all feel in the core of our being, and I know you feel it. I mean, you, I know you all, you're all special, but you're still kind of secretly mediocre, don't you think? <laughs>、um, so anyway, you may you may say you know this puzzle of mystery of existence is just you know silly mystery mongering. You're not astonished at the existence of the universe.、Um, you, you and you, you're in good company. You know, Bertrand Russell said, you know, I I should say the universe is just there. And that's all, you know, just a brute fact. And my professor at Columbia, Sidney Morgenbesser, a great philosophical wag, when I said to him, you know, Professor Morgenbesser, why is there something rather than nothing? And he said, oh, even if there was nothing, you still wouldn't be satisfied. So,、um, yeah. So okay. So you're not astonished, you know. I don't care, but I will tell you. I, I'll tell. I will tell you something to conclude. I guarantee you will astonish you because it's astonished. All of the brilliant, wonderful people I've met at this TED conference, when I've told them, and it's this: never in my life have I had a cell phone. Thank you. <laughs>